Hey, Nick. What the hell happened? What <laughs> <laughs> I'm recording that because I wanted to have that shot as an intro. I stopped recording. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another issue of the Grey Market Talk with a former market maker without a beard now and uh, a still cleanly shaven portfolio manager, chief investments officer, former bond trader extraordinary, Nick Themistocle. Hello, Nick. Good to see you. Hey, Thorsten. I have recorded, obviously, your first reaction earlier when you saw me without the beard. And I thought, yeah, I have to clip that. I put it in front so you've seen it already, what his original reaction was. So let's start straight away with what we have prepared for today. I think it should be, well, let's say at least interesting. I called it my quite interesting slides for today. Grooming tips with Thorsten, thoughts from abroad and some other stuff. Let's start with the grooming tips. So how did that happen? Uh, my trusted barber for 10, 12 years is on holidays in Syria. And as Abdullah, that's his name, wasn't here, I thought I'd try it myself. So what I did, I used my grooming tool and started here. And this bit is adjustable. So it went right through a bit of my moustache. Uh, I had no chance of rescuing my facial beard. So I could go for... Uh, a toothbrush beard. Nobody wanted to have that. I tried out uh, how they're called uh, Lenny from Ace of Spades. Um, fame also didn't look. I thought, okay, what I'm going to do is now I'm going to shave it off and I'm now running through and then I'm finishing this little uh, intermezzo through the four stages. For the next two weeks, I'll look like an old dude who hasn't shaved. Then I'll look like an old dude who's trying to look like a hipster. And then finally, Abdullah can uh, groom my hopefully grown beard then back into the normal shape so i hope these answered our questions um about what is going on and i will survive my wife said to me i married you when you were clean shaven so that's all right uh but you will see me in a gray market talk soon with a gray beard again so let's kick into the really interesting stuff what is this picture in front of me i wanted to this is now thoughts from abroad go a little bit into detail what's happening in germany YouTube always friendly provides us with the demographics of the people who are seeing our little show. <clears throat> and more and more people are uh, not from Germany. They actually are interested in what's happening in Germany on the ground. So I thought, okay, fine. What's the topic? And the topic is coming with taxes. I received an email from my tax advisor because in Germany, the Growth Opportunity Act has been published. And the lady here seems to be the front lady of my financial advisor, of my tax advisor. Um, and this lady to the right is not the same lady. She's actually the head of the Social Democrats in Germany, and she's a self-proclaimed Marxist communist. So I was asking myself, has my tax advisor a great sense of humor, or has he not seen it? I might call him on Monday, and we'll try to find out. And uh, let's come back to the Growth Opportunity Act, which went through German Parliament right now. Uh, it will cost the taxpayer, that's how they always frame it, 9 billion euros. I don't think it will cost the taxpayer 9 billion euros. It's just they're not taking away 9 billion euros from the taxpayer they used to. Uh, it's a different way of looking at stuff. But what does that involve, actually? And the interesting thing about that is, I went through the details, low-value assets amortization has increased from 800 euros to 1,000 euros. So I can immediately deduct stuff which is worth more than 800 bucks. Otherwise, I would have to uh, amortize it for over five years. So now it has been increased to 1,000 euros. That's one big point. Then gifts to associates. Yeah, If I want to make Nick a Christmas gift for spending week after week with me discussing the things that are happening in financial markets, uh, I was now, I'm now allowed to give him a gift for 50 euros before we both have to start taxing. Uh, if it goes over 50, he has to put it into his tax returns and I can't deduct it. It was 35 before. So that's a huge improvement for the German economy. 
private sales transaction. If I want to sell privately something, I have not to pay taxes if the value is below 600 euros. They dramatically increased that to 60,000 euros. No, they didn't. They increased it to 1,000 euros. So that will give you a lot of employment chances for people who really count on the German uh economy to uh, to increase and then uh, one of the points which is a pain in everybody's ask who runs a business is the regular advanced sales vat tax returns you have to file them all the time but now the rescue by the uh, finance ministry has arrived and if i earn less than tw or if i have revenue of less than 22 case i don't have to do it every month or every quarter i can just do it on an annual basis or if i have uh, uh, VAT coming in of less than 2K. So, Nick, you are the foreigner in this conversation. Do you think they've saved the German economy? Well, it's always nice to see somebody, um, you know, remembering it's the economy, stupid. Um, is that enough? I don't think so. Um, and it's not really about the future. It's kind of putting a little carrot in front of everybody. You still, you're a long way away from, from doing something like the Inflation Reduction Act, which, which poured billions into the US economy, which, you know, look to invest for the future in, in factories and new technology and all of this stuff. Um, and I'd say, you know, it's probably too little, too late to save the, uh, the Europeans. So that was pretty much my view. As a little entrepreneur, I'm not uh, having any inclination to say, yeah, let's build up a big company or hire more people because they make my life easier. Uh, that's simply not what's going to happen. So, yeah. And on the other side, now it's the part of my big rent. It's the so-called citizen's allowance will be increased from next year on. What is the citizen's allowance? It's basically free income for everybody who is a citizen of Germany, not a national, a citizen of Germany. So if you're in Germany, you're entitled, if you're out of work, to these payments. And there was actually an interesting interesting discussion in Parliament where our uh, 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 Minister for Economics and uh, Finance, Mr. Lindner, did a little calculation and said, okay, if you live in Germany, you're unemployed, you're a family of five, two grown-ups, both not working, and three children. And uh, you will get out of this citizen's allowance the equivalent of 38,000 euros a year. That's net. Yeah? So I did the calculation myself. I found the figures on the internet. And I took Berlin because obviously the benefits for housing, which are also paid, are a little bit different vari uh, variations from city to city where you live. And in my calculation, if you live in Berlin, you're two grown-ups, you have three children, one of them is below 14, two of them are uh, uh, older than 14. Uh, then you come up with housing and all the benefits that come on top of it with the equivalent of 42,000 euros net basis. And then you can use any tool on the internet and say, okay, if I'm a hardworking uh, 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 family, yeah, my wife works, my hus uh, the husband works, uh, we have three children, we live in Berlin, and we have to pay taxes, and we have to pay our own living, how much money would I have to make to have the equivalent net payment we are dishing out on the citizen's allowance? And it always struck me, it's 60,000 on a gross basis you have to earn as this little family unit of five people. Interesting to know in Germany, if you're an individual, the highest tax rate, not the rich tax rate, yeah, there's something above, but the highest tax rate in Germany starts at 62,810 euros. That's 42%, which you have to fork out in taxes if you're above that threshold. And I thought to myself, how on earth? And oh yeah, by the way, you asked me earlier, how much does that cost the German state on top, yeah, the increase? And it will add another 10 to 20 billion in costs after this Bürgergeld, the citizen's allowance, has been increased. Uh, 10 is the low end. It's obviously the people who think nobody will uh, actually take that off. 20, I think, is the conservative estimate by conservatives who think, yeah, OK, that could add an additional, this time in real costs to the taxpayer. Uh, in my estimation, we'll probably end up at around 30 billion a year, which comes on top of it. So we have now two sides of the equation. For the hardworking guys in Germany, which are, surprisingly enough, only 20% of the workforce in Germany are net taxpayers. 80% are not net taxpayers. That does not mean they're not working. That just means they have so much benefits, school, you name it, streets, that on, uh, uh, on a net basis, 
they are being provided for in however you want to define it by uh, define it by the state. Twenty percent are really paying more uh, 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 than uh, they get out of the state. So we have a scenario here where um, those who produce get little pittance adjustments to give hope the growth opportunity act and on the other side we are making it less and less well let's put it that way if you live by incentives and i think pretty much every person on this planet does so why on earth would you work uh if you can get the same benefits or the same lifestyle then when you have a not a good paid but a medium to lowly paid job to want to provide for your family this we i think we know this is not going to last the only question is the timing when is this going to blow up nick you're as old as i am even older what's your experience with this whole social policies absolutely not in favor um any economy that is working its way just to cradle its people not incentivize work um you know good luck with growth and um I mean, we've, we've, we've said it all along that, uh, that the economies of Europe and especially Germany, um, you know, they're struggling and, uh, and policies like this are all going in the same direction. And it's, it's almost like a nanny state. I don't know how you, how you'd call it. Um, you know, as an outsider here, this is, uh, um, Germany is not open for business. Yeah, yeah, you can see that, and uh, that's why I. Why did I come up with prelimin preliminaries like this? Actually, because the interesting data point for us is again the elections that are coming up. I showed this uh, slide last week. That is the so-called Länderfinanzausgleich, which of the German uh, municipals or, or states is uh, a net payer uh, uh, to the whole state and passing money their citizens made on to uh, to other states, which are. Uh, in a deficit and the interesting bit about this is now there was a new opinion poll or uh, an election poll for saxony saxony is one of the states in germany with about four to five million uh, citizens so it's not one of the biggest ones and it's also a net taker as you could see on the former slide it's actually quite down here also but the interesting thing is with what i started with what is it doing what's the german state doing for those who produce or think entrepreneurial and what's what uh, what incentives is it delivering for those who are not working and for the first time the rfd this uh, it's always called right wing in germany let's leave that out for a moment has now overtaken the cdu the conservatives in saxony so without the rfd you couldn't built a government in this uh, little state of Germany anymore. And the interesting bit is we brought that last week. October is in Bavaria and in Hesse, two of the net payers coming into Germany. And the whole political trend seems to go into a really, here are the elections upcoming, by the way, seems to go into a really divisive situation we can see all over the planet, especially America, where conservatives and lips basically don't talk to each other anymore. They hate the guts of each other. So the time we grew up where you could have different, different political opinions and discuss and come out with a, with a compromise, with a good outcome for the people, seems to be completely out of the window at the moment. And that worries me a bit because... What does that eventually lead to? The end of a capitalist system in my playbook. Because if the middle classes or the lower classes are being screwed over all the time, they eventually want to blame somebody. Whom they want to blame? They want to blame the rich guys. Huh? And by the definition of what is rich, we've seen in Germany, you're apparently you're rich if you make more than 62 grand a year. A year. Think about that. Uh, so they will start picking on those first, which will lead to the fact that people in that bracket or above will eventually think, do I still want to work or do I also want to take the easy way out? And that worries me massively. Oh, by here, yeah, I prepared the chart already uh, about the population sizes in Germany. So you can see here Bavaria turning very conservative, uh, Hessen not very conservative at the moment, at least if you can listen to the polls. Turingia in the middle is one of the uh, states of the well 
of the former DDR, which used to be Germany uh, and then was separated by the Soviets after the war. Saxony, the same. And uh, there is a drift coming from the right, no pun intended, uh, part of Germany to the right political spectrum. And this cannot be positive in the development we see in Germany, because at the moment we have a quite lefty government in charge in Germany, without any doubt. You've just seen that. Yeah, They want to do good things for good people. And I even believe them that they have the best of motives in there. What they're forgetting is that uh, economies are incentive driven. And what I've learned in my history, and then I'll finish with that rant, is if socialists or communists cock things up, they never correct them. They just double down. And we are now in the period before the doubling down happens. Then we have a harsh winter, maybe, in front of us. Germany electricity prices are the highest in the world. Our chancellor at a meeting in, I think it was in Berlin, in front of industrial leaders, said, no, there will be no uh, special subsidies for electricity prices. They demanded four to five cents for the uh, kilowatt hour. Uh, at the moment, it's somewhere between 28 and 40 cents. You know, 40 cents is the cap. So steel industry, everything which is very heavily reliant on energy production will have a, a, a dramatic downturn in Germany. Bankruptcy rates in Germany, insolvencies have gone up 20% years on year from last year. And as the final little bit, I heard this, uh, I, I read this on LinkedIn. It was very interesting. The German unemployment authorities. Yeah, how how would you translate that? The Arbeitsamt in Germany, the unemployment office. Yeah. They they employ one hundred twenty thousand people, and the interesting guess was guess how many people they uh, transferred from being unemployed into work last year. One hundred twenty thousand people. So each person employed by the German state statistically was responsible for placing one person a year into employment. Um, if I look at all these things, Hoffmann von Fallersleben, uh, a German thinker, and uh, he said once, denk ich an Deutschland in der Nacht, bin ich um den Schlaf gebracht. If I think of Germany in the night, it robs my sleep. Uh, we are in this situation now, and why is this so interesting? And now we're coming actually to the economic part we can see here. With this and the inevitable recession hitting Germany very hard, hitting the Eurozone very hard, and then will spread. It comes from China, it comes from Europe, comes out of Germany. Uh, the United States are looking wobbly as well. Was it all transitory? Isn't that a nice segue I have here, Nick? Was yeah. the whole inflation thing transitory or not? And now I'm asking you as the, you don't want to call yourself an economist, but the guy who thinks very economically, uh, is it all over? Inflation, no topic anymore? Yeah, I mean, people don't really see inflation in the same way. So monetary inflation, price inflation. But, um, you know, we talked about this in episode one. In episode one, right, a long time ago, many months ago, we talked about the, the expansion of the money supply being responsible for um, the inflation that, that took off uh, in, in the Western world. And, um, and my comment to you then was, It'll go without the Fed or the ECB and, and uh, you know, it works itself out the system. And if you look at money supply numbers now, they are falling. They are, in fact, negative on a sort of a three-month basis or yearly basis. They are certainly going down, but there is still a lot of money in the system and that's keeping the uh, the economy going. But in terms of, you know, the money supply influence on inflation, in my view, um, that's working its way out of the system. That's in the short term. So I still see short term um, inflation going down. How far down it goes, honestly, I have really no clue. Um, whether it reaches the Fed's target or the ECB's target, uh, I don't know. They're all the same targets, whether it's, you know, they all follow each other's policies. But yeah, I mean, I'd say all of the stuff that was done is working its way out the system. And, uh, and that's what we're seeing. There is another chapter to come on this thing that uh, that may turn things around. And obviously, that's all this um, extra government spending and whether that's just another round of increase in money supply, which ultimately will have its sort of lag effect and work its way back into the system. You know, that's down the road. But for now, um, certainly, um, I, I would say that's, so the answer to your question is it trans was it transitory? I'd say, well, yeah. Um, but the bit they said that was transitory was this um, 
these supply shocks that um, you know the COVID created. I mean, yeah, I mean the supply shocks were transitory. You know, the the monetary bit that they did was longer transitory. Um, and now we're going to have a different potentially uh, influence on on inflation, and and that is the the price inflation element, and that is you know energy prices seem to have kind of bottomed out. So it could well be we see some price inflation coming through. Um, you know that's that's an, another topic on all of this thing, but um, you know those are different parts of the inflation definition. And um, and I would say the the second part of it, that's the monetary part, is definitely working its way out of the system. So the discussion going on is, is it secular or cyclical? So we are talking now not about secular inflation hitting the system, that what we have seen actually was a cyclical inflation in the whole system. And that is sorting itself out now. Well, the bit that the uh, um, the governments did with their fiscal policies, you know, during the COVID 20, you know, 2020, 2021, you know, that's definitely working its way out of the system. You know, the money, where did that money go? That money went into asset prices, that money went into growth, that money went into inflation. And, you know, you can't take that back. So the loaf of bread is still more expensive than it was. I mean, that's just fact. Uh, and, and the only thing that's now happening is, um, well, what happens? Is there any more money that's coming into the system? Or does this loaf of bread stay the same level? And do we actually, um, sorry to interrupt you there, but do we actually trust these official inflation figures? Let's say United States, 3.2% inflation, you know, or three, or maybe even below, whatever they might cook up. I came across a very interesting statistic which said, okay, Uh, if we look at consumer spending, it's still positive, around 1% or whatever. But somebody actually went in and said, yes, that is adjusted for inflation, how much the consumer spends, which they put on a credit card, which is a completely other uh, discussion here. However, if you look at items being bought, they still buy the same amount of items like they did a year before. So it's actually not going up yeah? uh, because the official inflation may be 3%, but... Uh, Me as a little housewife uh, going to the supermarket, I see that the real inflation is far away from what they officially tell us. It's still 10, 12, 15, 20 percent in cases. Yeah, When you buy napkins, I used to pay 50 cents two years ago. They're now almost a euro. Where well, you think, what happened here? And that hits all these things. So which is going through my mind. Yes, we have the official figures. Official figures are pointing down. It seems to be, yeah, might be transitory after all, like this thought implies. In reality, is that just what they're cooking up to keep us subdued? Yeah, inflation is not topping anymore. And we just rob it from the citizens. Or am I getting it wrong here? I mean, in answer to your question, do you trust the inflation numbers? I mean, and then, you know, do you really... Uh, no, um, and inflation is a personal thing. Yeah, I mean, we all we all buy our own little sort of things, and and you know what I buy is different to what you buy. So my inflation is different to your inflation. Um, but does it really matter whether these numbers are you know accurate or not? Um, you're never going to be accurate, but are you going to be in the rough ballpark? I mean, food inflation we know is much more expensive than the uh, than the headline rate. Um, but everything will sort of come into place. And there's obviously a lot of, we talked about this in one of our shows, um, that, um, there's a lot of these, uh, companies have taken advantage of the, of the headlines that are out there saying inflation. It just gives them an excuse to put up your napkins from 50 cents to a, a euro and, um, and, and upset you, obviously. Um, but they can only do that for so long, in my view. And, um, you know, one, one story at a time. Um, the monetary part, I think, is, you know, being sorted, but there is still a lot of money in the system. And, um, and it, you know, we, we also mentioned it uh, a while ago, the interest that is being paid um, by, for example, the Fed on their treasury bills. Um, now, where they're putting five and a quarter percent on, uh, on these things, I mean, where does that money go? That is fiscal. That's, that is stimulative. And that's much more stimulative than your Growth Opportunities Act, because that's something of the order of 600, 700, a trillion plus dollars. I mean, we're talking serious money that is stimulative. So that monetary stimulus is also working its way around the system right now. And, and that's why I say that, you know, that part of the story is, is kind of coming because, uh, you know, they, the Fed obviously don't consider it and neither do, 
to uh, many other analysts. Um, but, uh, you know, that's something that um, is, is down the road. Well, the next chart might give us a good idea where actually the money is going. I used that on our German show with Markus a week ago, but it's, it's just too good not to uh, go into it. Great it's, chart. Uh, yeah, it's the Purchasing Managers Index uh, worldwide. And you can see actually improving is green and uh, deteriorating is red. So you don't have to be a genius, uh, which I'm not, to look at this chart and think to yourself, okay, yeah, inflation might be at the end if I look at the red countries here because they suck. Purchasing managers are not investing in durable goods or anything of consequences. While if you look at the green uh, countries we have here, what do they have in common? They're either highly aspirational, like India, or they sit on tons and tons of resources. So they seem to be investing in durable goods to, well, uh, transform their economies into something which is worthwhile having, while all the other countries who are playing with socialist experiments are blowing up big time. Uh, Nick, your interpretation on this chart? Great chart. What does it, you know, show it to the ECB? And so when they say, oh, we need to raise rates, um, just say, why? Uh, don't understand. Uh, is it just because you're following yet again another order from the States? And, uh, uh, you know, where is the center of this chart, which is in deep red? It's Germany. Well, we're the, we're the only ones who actually are having this uh, uh, energy vendor, this complete change of an economy to uh, sustainable energy, uh, really in place. Yeah? Where we're doing it. Uh, our chancellor said again, no, there is no way, way back to nuclear power. Uh, the last three nuclear power plants we switched off. From that day on, we are net energy importers in Germany. The interesting thing is we also lose uh, uh, the ability to think in direction nuclear because we are still thinking of these old Chernobyl-type uh, nuclear power plants when we talk about that, mm. it, which is complete bullshit. Yeah, If you listen to clever guys on the internet in various podcasts who know their stuff, about uh, nuclear power there are so many innovations out there safe sources of energy thorium reactors uh, nuclear little almost you could put in your living room power plants which are by pure physics unable to blow up and we're not even thinking in this direction anymore while uh, developing countries you want to have energy you want to be able to cook you want to be uh, in a warm place so uh, there is a huge advantage being blown away from the countries in red we see here on the screen uh, to countries like India yeah, which I was deeply impressed you saw the news last week as well they landed a bloody rover on the moon yeah? so how many people are that now uh, brings us back to the bricks out of the uh, out of everybody who landed uh, a probe on the moon which are four it's the United States it's Russia it's India and uh, is it Japan no China Three out of the four are BRICS countries. So, yeah, let that sink in. Uh, so, up and coming, yeah. I really I really like this idea. If you see the Purchasing Managers Index, you see they're landing on the moon. Uh, at one point in time, we really have to think, are we blowing our stuff up here? Is it the end of an empire as we've seen it? Uh, and should we really start uh, packing our bags and moving into these countries? I don't know. Increasingly, so it's, you know, economic suicide is... Uh... There's, there's no other way to describe it. So what are we going to do? Because the next slide, we discussed that earlier because we weren't quite sure what it actually means. Um, if you look at equity markets, especially in the United States, yeah, still strong and uh, we had a little bit of weakness, but that seems to be out of the window again. We're building up again and it shows retail investors flows are exceeding 2021 highs. Uh, Nick immediately pointed out to me, we don't know. Does the flow go into bond markets or equity markets? The chart I ripped, obviously I was a little bit lazy, doesn't say that what it is. However, let's take it at face value. Retail customers are investing again at highest rates ever, while the traditional, let's put it in air quotes, Western world is very busy destroying itself. Is that a pump and dump we've seen here in the equity markets, Nick? Is that your last chance to get out? No, I mean, I, I, again, I, I think whilst governments are, um, you know, putting a floor on, you know, through their socialist policies and, and their fiscal spending and, you know, the money that's, you know, flooding into the system, put it this way, 
Um, I, you know, I don't see asset markets um, in danger. I see, you know, more the markets are extremely fragile. And, you know, when you think about how much, for example, the US have to borrow between, let's say, July till December, and that's sort of like one, one and three quarter trillion, um, you know, where does that money come from? It used to come from Japan. It used to be, uh, come from China. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, foreign policy and geopolitics and all of this stuff and bricks and whatever, you know, you're not getting the money anymore from, um, you know, from these places. So, so it has to come from somewhere. Now, somewhere are retail plus institutional money in the Western world. And, you know, if that money is coming from, um, you know, the, the, re the retail and institutional investors in the Western world, then they can't be putting that money in other places. And that includes in the economy and that includes in equity markets. So somewhere along the line, this thing is becoming extremely, you know, question mark um, because, you know, it really does mean can this thing be sustained? There's no way, in my view, that these institutions can continue to finance the US without the Fed stepping in, without there being some kind of accident in the plumbing somewhere along the way. Um, and that's more the thing I would worry about is, uh, you know, everything is moving right now very smoothly. The equity markets are sort of doing a little bit each day, and that's that's good to see. That's kind of in line. Um, but and we're seeing gradually just yields tick higher in the treasury market. But, you know, this this is the big question mark for me. How is it sustainable that the treasury market just says, OK, well, well, we'll just add a few basis points here and there over the over a week and, and everything will be fine. I just don't see it. We're, um, running in, we're running into your thesis of financial repression because you just mentioned Japan. Yeah? Japan for decades has financed because, well, of, of extremely low rates. Uh, 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 the carry trade. So money went into uh, the Western economies out of China. So they seem, seem to be pinching that horse. At the same time, you mentioned her, Mrs. Yellen is going to spend, I read somewhere 1.9 trillion till the end of the year. You just said one and three quarters trillion. Well, you know, soon we're talking about real money here. May it as it be, if this cheap money out of China or Japan doesn't buy treasuries anymore, is the only alternative what you already, well, wisely predicted, so sooner or later financial repression will kick in, that they will force pension funds or you name it to buy treasuries or banks to load up on treasuries like in the good old days? I mean, you've got to ask yourself the question, what are they waiting for, right? Because I actually did ask the question of, an, of a sort of a very respected economist uh, last week and uh, said, ah, surely this interest... The, you know, the, the, the government is paying, it's increasing the deficit, the deficit numbers. Nobody seems to care. And the response was, well, actually, you know what? Why should they? You know, because the, you know, the Americans will just continue to. And, you know, at the end of the day, this is it. They print money and, you know, they can continue to finance whilst they print money. So what are they waiting for? Do they just want to increase their bill so much? Um, and then they say, oh, actually, you know what, we should actually cap rates because, you know, if, if the investors stop buying this stuff, then who's going to buy it other than the Fed? I mean, I'd like to know. I just honestly, I can't see it. And, um, and that's the real thing for me is that, you know, are they just waiting for some mini explosion? in the treasury market? Are they waiting for yields like the gilt market exploded in October last year? Um, you know, Do they want to wait for something like that to come in and say, okay, now's the time. Now we're just going to sort of come in and do some QE type, but we're not going to call it QE. We're going to call it something else um, and, um, and stop the rot in the same way that the Bank of England did at that time. So honestly, don't know, but everything seems far too calm for me. And, um, uh, you know, I, I'd say we're getting closer to to something. Let me jump a slide here because that is quite interesting. It's how well capitalized, capitalized are the big banks. And you and I, we both remembered half a year ago or something when uh, there was a discussion whether they should uh, increase their equity ratio by 20% or something like that or 
risk capital they keep. And I found this very interesting. SVB on the right, you obviously see the big failure if you don't have the chart in front of you, blew up. And all the other big banks, yeah, sy systemically relevant, uh, which we have here on the screen, they are not far off of the capital, uh, tier one capital risk weight assets uh, in this scenario. So if we have now the uh, 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 what we just described here, Mrs. Yellen needing lots and lots of dosh so how is she going to do that? She's supplying the market with uh, with treasuries. Um, China and Japan are out of the market for buyers. Um, so there is obviously the, the real risk that inflation is not going away. Maybe it's not transitory. So we'll stay at high rates, maybe even higher rates, as the treasury market indicated for the last, let's say, two weeks, when people started smelling the, the rat we have somewhere. Could that be the blow up that we see one of the big banks or are they going to pinch the horse before the public knows? Because they couldn't do it in 2008. I bet they tried. The Brits didn't do it with Northern Rock. I bet they tried, but then they bungled it anyway. The answer to that is um, we'll find out after the event rather than before the event. But, um, you know, the banks are obviously buying lots of treasuries. They, they have to, um, you know, the question is, can they keep buying it? Um, it's not free for them. They have to, you know, put up capital for it. And if they're putting up capital for it, they're using up um, balance sheet capacity, um, balance sheet capacity, which uh, would otherwise go into the real economy. So the government is slowly strangling the real economy. And so the only way that they are making it up is by continuing to stimulate the economy through through more spending. And in the same way that the Germans uh, kind of sort of figured out, oh, well, if the Americans put money in the economy and the Americans putting trillions into their economy, you know, let's put nine billion uh, through some growth um, um, incentive scheme. You know, it's just it's, it's just a, a drop of water on a hot stone. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of meaningless, but it's clear that the government are becoming a far more important part of the economy they are steering the economy. We talked about that as well over the last uh, yeah. week. You know, command and control. You know, the more that you actually steer the economy, the more the people become reliant on you, and uh, and and you and your institutions like the Fed will steer the economy, and and that's what's going on right now. It's it, it's it's fascinating to watch, but it's also scary. Okay, let's come to the point because that is actually contradicting what I was asking you earlier when we went through the slides. Is uh, right in front of me, I have a chart from the Financial Times. Chinese bonds have strongly outperformed US treasuries. It's a chart going back to 2010. And it shows the Chinese government bond index versus U.S. Treasury index. And you see huge alligator jaws. I've asked Nick earlier, hey, is that a trade of a lifetime? Do I have to now load up on U.S. Treasuries and short the shit out of China? Or am I getting wrong again? Nick, get, am I getting it wrong again? Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, wh why would I be worried about buying Chinese government bonds? Um, uh, you know, at the end of the day, they have to keep their interest rates low. Um, they are putting money in their system. The world is not saying we are worried about this thing. They're not treating China as an emerging market, right? So if, if China was an emerging market, that it would look at a different state. Um, the U.S., however, um, you know, sorry to say this, but um, but if if they have to have such high interest rates to uh, to finance their debt, that's probably more closer to an emerging market than uh, than the Chinese are. And the only time you'd want to buy it, treasuries is a when you feel that the inflation is falling and policy rates are falling as well. And if the policy rates are still so high, which they are, and they are still saying they want to continue to raise rates, then, you know, now's not the time. I favor a kind of stabilization in the treasury market. I favor, if anything, rates um, for a trade going lower. But I have to say, there are many people who have got this trade on, and perhaps the, what's likely to happen is, you know, rates spike higher, Fed come in, uh, and then they get rates back down to, you know, below 4% in the 10 year. Um, but for now, you know, not interested in buying this stuff. And, and it looks like since 2022 there, you know, the trend is still intact that rates are higher. And on my signals, my own signals, you know, I keep watching this thing like a hawk. Um, and it hasn't said, you know, the turn has come. And I even look at things like 
SPX versus or SPY versus TLT. So to see the ratio of equity versus um, um, bond ETFs, and the trend is still in favor of the equity markets versus bonds. So, you know, don't I, I always would wait for the trend rather than just take a punt because you'd been wrong all the way down here. It's actually quite interesting that you say that. I'm plugging. I have a show uh, recorded yesterday with uh, Murat. We're going into the relative rotation graph. And he's actually, with the analysis of the price action, he's confirming your view here. Um, the closest so one is Germany versus German bonds, right? So if you look at DAX versus German bonds, they are much closer to buying German bonds, selling German equities than the US is, I must say. So, you know, based on your picture as well of PPI, you can imagine that Europe, Europe may well be the point where, um, you know, the central bank turns before uh, the US. You know, I can't imagine that they do something before they're you know, they're, they're masters, but um, obviously they may well do that. And uh, and price action may well tell them to do that. It's very okay. clear, I must say. I'm pretty sure Germany is blowing up long before the United States are going to do that. Huh? Uh, if our economy uh, is doing what they're doing at the moment, it's just a question of time. We had that point. No, anyway, thank you very much for that, Nick. I wanted to end on the usual fear and greed index. We are in America, according to CNN. Uh, in the territory of greed again, which is to be expected. Yeah, every time we see recovery, we are getting greedy little retail investors going in, buying the dip. But uh, I had an interesting conversation with a portfolio manager. And he said, oh, yeah, I've just bought NVIDIA. I said, are you crazy buying NVIDIA? <laughs> he said, well, I, I, used the, uh, I used the recent correction, not because I believe in NVIDIA. Yeah? 40 times sales, it's, of course, bullshit. But that's why I'm hiding my money. I'm also going into Apple. Uh, my investors want me to be invested in these, uh, uh, well, big caps or fan fancy stocks, and that's why I'm putting my money in. I'm, I'm eagle, uh, with eagle eyes. Obviously, they're watching what they're doing, but they said, "Yeah, I'm drifting my market forces," and that reminded me uh, of a conversation I read 20 years ago. Um, what was the name of the partner of George Soros who was running his own show? One of the who's never lost on a 12-month basis. Oh, you mean, um, um, oh, what's his name? Big, big guy. Um, yeah, okay, we'll come to us as well. Yeah, uh, he said, uh, he was asked, so yeah, you inv invested right at the top in the uh, TMT bubble after you shorted before and lost money. Uh, what did you learn from that? And he said, uh, uh, drug Miller, Stanley drug Miller. Yes, that, that's it. Uh, yeah. He said, I, I didn't learn anything from that. And uh, then he was asked by the interviewer, so what do you mean? He said, I knew I was doing bullshit, but I had to do it. I was forced. Yeah, my clients were about to abandon ship because I wasn't invested in that. I was uh, short too early. Thankfully, I got it right at the end and got out early because sometimes it's worth panicking early when you know things are not working out. Uh, but uh, that is a little bit the situation which is crossing my mind at the moment. And one of my former colleagues at Best Learns, Jesse Felder, who runs his own uh, uh, research service and sends out very good emails free once a Saturday, he brought that to my attention. And uh, talking about China, obviously, again, it was Alibaba versus Amazon. And I like that chart. And I don't like his analysis if I got it right, he said, on the left side, we see two-year growth of sales per share. And we have the blue line is Alibaba and the red line is Amazon. And they're obviously narrowing together and uh, are in a downtrend. On the other side, you see the PE ratio of Amazon versus Alibaba. Alibaba PE ratio dropping, 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 and Amazon going up and up and up and up and up. So uh, if I analyze him correctly, I think we've been too harsh on China. If you want to invest, go for Alibaba. I saw it the other way and said, sell the shit out of Amazon. Nick, any opinion you want to venture on that? Well, you know, you would have been you would have been wrong, um, you know, all the way. Now, I didn't down. do it and I wouldn't have done it, Nick. I know, but you imagine that. So we're and, and that's why I'd say, okay, if if you came to me and said, right, that's the trade, Nick. You know, I've had a look at these charts, I want to sell Amazon. I say, okay. What's the driver of this thing? It's not surely because there's a big gap between the blue line and the red line. Um, there must be a driver for the timing. And, and you know, whatever chart you look at, um, uh, you know, I don't see uh, a, a timing thing that basically says do, do uh, one thing or the other right now, either to sell Amazon and buy Alibaba 
or to sell Amazon on its own. Frankly, they they you know they look good trades. That you know I've I've I thought for ages Alibaba are bloody cheap. Got to have them, but you got to find the point, and that's you know the point has not come clearly uh, yet. You know these markets in in China are driven by in Asia are driven you know by other factors, and so you've got to be patient for those. I still believe that they will be right than wrong. So I'd ra- I prefer the relative value trade rather than the outright trade. And for you, you know, in the outright trade for you being selling into strengths, but there's no indication of that strength actually petering out right now. And therefore, for that reason, I don't I wouldn't have a reason. I'd have less of a reason to do that than I would do putting on the relative value trade. Yeah, well, I would come back to you and say, yes, my base case is still that we're going to see a recession slash depression. Consumer discretionary is going to tank. Go and sell something else. <laughs> <laughs> Go and sell something. Go and sell yeah. But for, for now, I haven't I done anything. Going let's, down. Let's, keep an, let's keep an eye on that, Nick. Uh, because, I will, uh, I've got the rel- relative thing up, you know, when you showed it to me uh, an hour ago. And, uh, you know, at, at the moment, the chart doesn't uh, indicate. That, uh, that I mean, the short-term chart favors Alibaba versus Amazon, but the long-term chart is still a long way off. Uh, well, I will keep everybody on this channel posted when I start a typical probing attack with some derivative structures, just uh, to see whether the market catches on to it or not. But you know my strategies. I'll start with a little, let's see, get our beak wet, how the Americans say. And uh, if it doesn't work out, I sit on the sideline and look at it till it eventually works out nick i thank you so much for spending the time with me even though i'm clearly shaven and look a bit like an investment banker again uh I should, the put, next time. Yeah, I, I should i should put the braces on but i hope it's growing back faster than i anticipate thank you so much for being our guests today um yes i bought you a little bit with a rant on germany and grooming tips but i think uh, the economic discussion we had here about ppi and is inflation um, transitory after all, I think brings high value. And if you like this, share us, subscribe to us. And as always, I give the last word to Nick. Nick, any last words? Even, even though you might get the, uh, the, the the trade wrong, the, the idea wrong, you still seem to make an awful lot of money with your options. So uh, um, I think that's probably the most important part of this, uh, this, this talk. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye.